we're going to have Dr. Jacob do one more session um, with us, and then following that, we'll follow with some conversation. We've got two respondents we've asked to sit with us in a moment, and your questions will be welcome. So during this time, if you would, any of the um, five by seven cards that are available to you, begin writing down those questions that you can feed them to us um, following this last presentation. And we go back to Dr. Jacob. Thank you very much. Okay. All right. We nourished, ready to dive in. <clears throat> I got some caffeine going through me, not that I needed it. Got enough adrenaline pushing that blood around. Okay, the hope of glory. What is it? When is it? Have we got it all wrong? I think we're able on some level to answer those questions. What is it? It's a sense of ruling. It's a sense of having the authority of God given to us to represent him on the earth. When is it? It is now. We are glorified. We are identified now by the true human, the Son of God, Jesus himself. Have we got it all wrong? Yes. <laughs> um, we'll do the first slide here. Okay. What is glory? Does or is it a reflection of the radiance or the splendor of God? Yeah, possibly. Sometimes. But what I would say to that is that indicates something else. In other words, signs or symbols point to the more important object, right? Glory, the glory of God, the splendor of God is not important because this is beautiful, bright, shining light. It's important because that beautiful, bright, shining light is the only means by which a non-physical body can be displayed in a way that we can see how magnificent God actually is. Because you can't just take words and make a word cloud and make that glory. You can't give God a body, right? So when Moses is seeing the glory of God, he's seeing the splendor of God, but is it the light that's important? Does Moses say, I want to see your light? Or does Moses saying essentially, God, reveal yourself to me? And the only way that a non-physical body can be revealed when it is about the creator God of the universe is through something like what we envision this splendid array of light to be, okay? Where is glory? Is it in heaven? Yes, but is it only in heaven, which is to say in the future? No, it's here. Moreover, where is heaven? We're not going to take any time with this, but just a quick challenge. Is heaven up there, out there? <laughs> yes. The easier question is where is God? God is here. What did Jesus pray? May your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. That is in Matthew where he refers to the kingdom of heaven. The place where God and humanity come together is heaven. That's why the holy of holies was so important. It's the place where the earth and heaven come together. The Garden of Eden was a sanctuary, a temple, the Garden of Eden was the first holy of holies. It's where earth and heaven are brought together. God dwells in relationship with his people. He walks with them. He talks with them. And only after humanity is banished from the presence of God are the sense of heaven and earth separate until we have the tabernacle and the first holy of holies, when heaven and earth, God and humanity come together, that's a good thing in that God again dwells in the midst of his people. It's a bad thing in that it's only one chappy who actually gets access to God, right? The high priest on the day of atonement, once a year. Nobody else got access to God. Which is why when we say we believe Jesus is God incarnate, 
And part of my definition of how I think of the gospel as God having returned to dwell with his people, we're now back to heaven and earth coming together in the way that they were meant to be originally. By the Holy Spirit working through people and inhabiting us, and we then, of course, become the what? The temple of God, that Paul says. You are a temple because you are the place where heaven and earth come together in the same way that Jesus was that walking tabernacle, in the same way that the Garden of Eden was a tabernacle. So where is heaven? Heaven is here. Yes, heaven is out there, but heaven is here. Where will the heaven be of our kind of afterlife? Will we be out there? I don't think so. And here's one reason why. Did Jesus rise from the dead with a physical body? It was physical. He ate food. Did he need a physical body if he's going to live for eternity above the clouds with some cherubim and some, you know, heart playing and however we want to think about what that heaven out there might look like? You only need a physical body if you anticipate a physical world in which to live. Why will we be raised with new bodies? We don't need a physical body if we're going to float off into some spiritual other land out there. We look forward to the resurrection of our life, the resurrection of our bodies, because this is the place that God will inhabit and dwell when evil is eradicated, when goodness is restored from what it was originally. That's what God is working toward through Jesus' death on the cross and through his redemption of each of us. He's restoring goodness to creation anticipating the day when the kingdom of God will be the only kingdom that reigns on the earth. And God's people worship him and him alone. So when is glory future eternal life? Yes. But if Jesus is already living this eternal existence, and he is your truest identity, then you are living your eternal existence. You have already been granted eternal life. The life that you were born with, spiritual life, has ended, and you've been granted a new eternal spiritual life. Your physical life, your physical body, yes, has yet to see the end of its life, but the hope that we have is because we already exist in Jesus, in that plane of eternity, that also your physical body will be restored because that's your truest identity. So heaven will be here. In a sense, heaven is here because this is the place that God is restoring. So let's go to the next slide. Um, Okay, it's the question of what does it look like to be glorified? So if glory is rule, we can all say, but, but, I, what, we don't rule, we don't have dominion, we don't have authority, we don't have power to do things. What does it look like for us to be glorified? Well, who is our truest identity? Jesus. What did it look like for Jesus to be glorified? The cross. See, I think one of the reasons for why we struggle to think of ourselves as having glory now is because we're prone to think of it, naturally so, we're prone to think of it through the lens of our culture. We think of somebody on the throne with power as somebody who has glory. You and I, we don't sit on thrones. At least I don't sit on a throne. (laughs) The thrones that I do sit on are thrones I don't think I want to, as in like, yes, I'm chair of my department. All that means is administrative headache. (laughs) 
do I want to have this particular throne that's been given to me? When we think of glory in the way that the world thinks of glory, we misunderstand what is essentially the greatest paradox of Christianity. The greatest paradox of Christianity is the fact that God revealed his glory on a cross. And that's an easy thing for us to forget. Karl Barth, some of you may know the name. Um, Karl Barth was a theologian, um, a German theologian, <coughs> Swiss theologian, um, in the, the 1940s, who wrote um, many, many theological tomes, but was also one of the key people, theologians, part of the German Lutheran Church, who raised his voice against Nazi Germany one of the very few German fasters who did so. One thing that he wrote is this, God's equal has found his right in this, that in his abasement and humiliation, he is Lord over all. God has found his glory in this, that he prepares his kingdom in incomprehensible condescension. The world thinks of kingdoms and glory and power as what? Majesty, as wealth, as status, as reputation, celebrity status, or monarchical status, or wealth. What Karl Barth is getting at in this quotation is the God of the universe, the God who created all things and said it is good and then sat back and reflected on the goodness that that God is establishing his kingdom on earth not through wealth and not through reputation and not through having loads of friends or assistants or however we might think of glory. But that God establishes his kingdom on earth through suffering. It's on the cross that God established his kingdom. This is a, a photo I just, I adore. It's my photo from um, Mont Saint Michel, um, the I don't know if any of you have been off the coast of France, a little island that you can only get to when the tide is low. Um, it's just this beautiful little church monastery thing. Um, and I don't know why, but I just had this, one of those kind of sacred moments where you just see something and God just speaks to you. And that cross, I think it's because I was just looking, it was so high and looking up at it that it just struck me and... For whatever reason, now, when I think of glory, I think of this image. Um, high and lifted up. Do you remember the, um, the, this just comes, this is not, I did not plan for this. This is the idea that I just had. The contemporary Christian worship song, high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, right? Again, popular Christian notions of what glory is. But when we think of high and lifted up, it's not necessarily him up in heaven shining, but rather this is high and lifted up, right? You put them on the cross and they are high and lifted up, not shining in a radiant light of glory, but with blood and pain and suffering. So Jesus' glory the glory of God is revealed on the cross, which is hard for us to understand. It was hard for first century Jews to understand, which is why Paul said in Corinthians, this is foolishness to the Jews, nonsensical to the Greeks or the Romans. It doesn't make sense anybody to anybody here today either, right, in our culture. And yet, this is the foundation of Christianity, the creator God of the universe, entered into this world of brokenness and ended his time here, or close to the end anyway, on a cross, suffering. And in that cross, or on that cross, 
redeem the world, right? Paul says in Colossians, it was on the cross that he brought peace. On the cross that he triumphed over his enemies. Glory, triumph, reign, rule, victory over these spiritual enemies through this torture device. So somehow, in the midst of this, is this paradox that he could have this ultimate victory over evil and spiritual forces that have kept his good created world in a state of brokenness, and he could do that by dying on a cross. So what we'll do then, I want to walk you through some verses where throughout the New Testament we see God's glory revealed in these ways. You kind of think theologically about them, maybe in a way that you haven't before. And then when we can see those, then we're able to see how that relates to us and our glory and our lives. So we'll go to the next one. The um, first place we want to go is the Gospel of John. The Gospel of Glory, it's known as. In the Gospel of John, the first half of it or so is what we call the Book of Signs, where um, we see Jesus doing, performing these miracles. John has the um, seven signs where he, he you know, heals, um, feeds the 5,000, raises the centurion's child, does these various different things in the Book of John while also having the I am statements, I am the way, truth, and life, I am the bread of life, I am the resurrection of the life. So in the first half of the book of John, it is these things. The second half, scholars refer to it as the book of glory because of the number of times that glory gets used. Glory is also used previous to the second half of the gospel, and I've I've found a few here before moving you on. But the Gospel of John, it's leading to the, the theme that is throughout is this idea of Jesus' glory and the time for Jesus' glory to be revealed. So you'll remember in John chapter 2, Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Think of this right here. Did Jesus demonstrate some sort of effervescent light at the wedding of Cana? No, right? No, he didn't be bright and shining. What did he do at the wedding at Cana? Yes, he changed water into wine. How was he revealing his glory in doing that miracle? He's revealing his what? his power, his authority over the natural elements, his status of being somebody who's able to make these things happen in a way that is not normal for our earthly world. I can't change water into wine. Maybe you can. But I don't think it was a natural thing for humans to do. Of course it wasn't. But the bigger question, what does John mean when he says Jesus revealed his glory in doing this? He didn't have some light. He revealed that he is God. He is the one who is there at creation, right? The word was with God and the word was God and all things exist because of the word, right? Just one chapter before this. And now he's revealing that he is this God, this God of power, this God who spoke things into being. He's revealing his glory. Chapter 5, I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not accept me. If another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe when you accept glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the one who alone is God? Do you think the disciples were looking for the idea of them being bright, shining like the stars someday in the future? Are they looking for reputation? Are they looking for the honor that you get from being with the cool guy of Galilee who's doing all these miracles? 
What glory are they looking for? What's he referring to with glory? Some sense of status. It's a status symbol. Okay, John 12, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. This is the turning point in the Gospel of John, when now what John is going to do is essentially turn us towards Jerusalem and to the cross. And we're going to have the upper room discourse where Jesus will speak about how he and the Father are one. He'll ask the Father to glorify him and he glorify the Father and all that's coming. He'll pray for the disciples. We'll have the foot washing ceremony in the upper room, right? All these things are now coming. The signs are done, and now we turn our sights to Jerusalem. Now the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified, right? This is the goal, okay? Um, The next slide. John 17, after Jesus had spoken these words, he looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so that the Son may glorify you since you have given him authority over all people to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. Okay, and John 19. The soldiers, this one doesn't have glory. This is the description of the glorification. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, right? When we're thinking of the sense of honor and kingship and royalty. The soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thrones and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. We're familiar with the kingship imagery, the kingship language, right? To be a king is to be crowned, to be glorified, to have that sense of honor, of power, authority, and rule. But of course, what John is doing in his description is to describe that for Jesus, the glory that's being granted him is a mockery. And yet, it's entirely real. Because the great irony of all of this is he is Yahweh. He is the God of creation who controls all things. He is the king of the Jews in the way that they have never understood Yahweh to be the king of the Jews. This is the God of creation and the universe who is on this throne and being mocked as a king. Father, the hour has come for the Son to be glorified. Right? God, the time has come for the world to see your glory. How is this possible? And then we think of something like the cry of dereliction, where Jesus is on the cross and he says, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's part of this glory also. Suffering abasement, rejection, alone, isolation. This is God. This is Yahweh on the throne in the person of Jesus, right? Second person of the Trinity, who is there at creation, who spoke things into being. Part of this hour of glorification is also this cry of dereliction. John's gospel is entirely about how God is known in the world through what he does in restoring people's lives and how he reveals himself as the God who suffers. Okay? So the gospel of John is wildly important and 
um, in a future life, um, maybe when my kids grow up and are out of the house, will that happen? <laughs> right now, I just need to get one out of diapers. <laughs> we'll think about getting them out of the house later. In my future you know, instantiations of, of research and writing, I would love to go back uh, to a question that I was asked. Some of you are familiar with the name um, Jimmy Dunn or James Dunn. I was with him at a conference, and he said, so what do you think that the relationship is between John and Paul? And I was like a grad student. I thought, I don't know. I'm just talking to this wildly famous person. Why are you asking me these questions? <laughs> like, don't ask me questions. Just tell me things. Um, and I, I would love to now, now kind of think more about that because I think... I think he saw what I'm only beginning to see. How for Paul and John, the sense of glory, which is important to both of them, actually is woven throughout both of their texts in very similarly and remarkably similar ways. So, um, but as an aside. Okay, the next thing, let's turn to um, Revelation. So we mentioned this last night. Um, We're going to say for our purposes that John wrote Revelation. The throne room scene, right? Um, In fact, look at at me. Don't look at the text right now. Um, The throne room scene, we said last night that this is key for all apocalyptic literature and that Revelation is an apocalyptic text and this is subversive writing where we have a minority group who are being oppressed by an empire and they are writing these visions and these visions are about the question of evil. They're looking around and they're seeing their plight, they're seeing their suffering, their persecution, and they're asking the question all of us ask, God, where are you? Who's in charge? And God gives John this vision, right? He sees, looks up to heaven, sees the door open, somebody standing in the door saying, come, come, and I will show you what must take place after these things. John then goes through that door and is given this vision of a throne room scene. And the throne room scene is apocalyptic in all the ways that they always are. There is lightning and thunder There's a river of fire. There are chariots with eyes around and within, right? Taken directly from Zechariah. Angels with eyes around and within. All these apocalyptic imagery that he draws from Daniel, from Zechariah, from these other apocalyptic texts of the Old Testament. But he sees this throne room scene and God on the throne. And as we read the very confusing and very misused and abused book of Revelation, when we read everything that happens from this point until the end, when we're reading about the various battle that might take place or the stars falling from the sky or whatever these visions might be at the different locations in the text, there's one thing we're meant to remember, and that is this throne room scene. This is the answer to every question we have for Revelation from this point onward, okay? So, chapter five. Then I saw in the right hand of the one seated on the throne a scroll written on the inside and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. Right? So stick with that. He's looking, and he sees no one able to open the scroll, the scroll or look into it. An elder comes and tells him, don't weep, it's okay. Why? Because a conquering lion of the tribe of Judah has overcome. The lion of the tribe of Judah, lion, has overcome. And he is able to do this task. So John hears the elder say this to him. And then... 
John looks. Okay, so he hears the elder say this, and then he looks, and he says, Then I saw between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. He went and took the scroll from the right hand of the one who was seated on the throne. When he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. They sing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slaughtered, and by your blood you ransomed for God's saints from every tribe and language and people and nations. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests serving our God, and they will reign on the earth. We'll come back to that. But the point right now is, John is told a conquering lion has overcome. And what he sees is a slain lamb. In other words, the victorious God, Jesus as conqueror, is displayed currently on the throne as a lamb being slaughtered, a sacrificed lamb. Not the conquering lion, the sacrificed lamb. And that's important for the book of Revelation because the book of Revelation is written for Christians who are also being slaughtered. Christians who are being persecuted by the Roman Empire. Christians who are being persecuted by their friends and family who refuse to come and buy their food or their goods at the market because they have no longer agreed to worship Nero but have given their only allegiance to this random Jew from Nazareth. They are being persecuted, but you know what? The God who's fighting their battles, he also was persecuted. He is still a slain lamb on the throne. And that is how he ruled. He conquered by being a slain lamb. And that's the foundation of the book of Revelation. Have hope, because even though you're suffering, we know that suffering is part of how God redeems the world. Look at the cross. Look at Jesus. So the book of Revelation is wildly important for our conversation. So that's John. Now we'll turn to Paul. Okay, the next one, Philippians. The Philippians hymn. You've heard this before. You've read it before. There's probably more ink that has been spilled on these verses, trying to figure out what the heck Paul means, than on any other text, certainly of Paul's letters, and maybe even of the whole Bible. For the reason being that many of these words are only found here in this hymn, and so it's hard to make sense of what he actually means. So every version is different, every translation is different from the next one. Um, and of course, they're all theologically weighty. So we get our canonic theology, kenosis, Jesus emptying of himself from this verse. What does that mean? What did he empty himself of? Um, all the things. So there's lots written here. This is, um, interestingly, I find fun, a fun idea. This is probably not original to Paul. He probably did not write this out of his own mind. This was likely a Christian hymn or piece of poetry that was being circulated throughout the churches. And this would be the answer to why so many of the words in this text are unusual to Paul's letters. We all have a way of writing, a vocabulary that we use. And it would be very unusual to have somebody suddenly use all kinds of different words. That's how I know my students are plagiarizing. <laughs> when suddenly they go from a B level to an A plus graduate level sounding piece of work. And I think, what's changed here? <laughs> it's that idea with this. And so that would make this, if this theory is correct, it would make this likely the earliest Christian writing that we have for the churches. In other words, this is the first creed of who Jesus is. 
Philippians 2, Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, death even on a cross. Okay, so we track with that. He is God. He's found in very nature God. He is of the status of God. And he elects to make himself nothing. So we're talking not about him giving up his divinity. He's giving up his status by taking on the status of a servant, right? King and servant are not two different entities in terms of humanity. They're two different entities in terms of their status, their power, their hierarchy. He makes himself nothing, taking the nature of a servant, having been made in human likeness. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbles himself further and goes to death. But then he humbles himself further by taking death on the cross, the status symbol for the lowest of people in the hierarchy of the Roman Empire. A king does not get executed on a cross. A robber gets executed on a cross. A revolutionary gets executed on a cross. A slave gets executed on a cross. So, right, so we see what this hymn is doing, or this hymn, this poetry, whatever this is, saying Jesus is Lord. And he takes on the status, not just of a human, a slave, slave, death, death, cross. But did he stop being Lord? And the answer, therefore, God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, when it says that the name of Jesus, every name, every knee shall bow, um, it's not the name of Jesus. Jesus is a common name in the same way that Jesus is a common Spanish name today. Jesus, many people would have been named Jesus. It's just the, uh, you know, the new version the, of the Aramaic of, of Yeshua, Joshua, the Hebrew, God saves. It's not the name Jesus, it's the name Lord. Kurios, Lord, that people will bow their knee to. By the way, we don't bow knees, do we? We bend knees. So there's just a translation issue that we never think about, but it sounds good. Every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Okay, so the question is, what is this therefore, therefore? How are we to make sense of this therefore? We typically think that because Jesus gave up of himself and all these things, and because he died, that as a result of that, he is now declared Lord. As a result of his death and resurrection, he now gets to be declared Lord. So first suffering, therefore, as a result, lordship. But did he ever stop being Lord? No. He was Lord of the universe when he changed that water into wine at Cana. He was Lord of the universe when he raised Lazarus from the dead. He was Lord of the universe when he washed his disciples' feet. He was Lord of the universe when he was on that cross. I'll do the next slide. Here I go back to Karl Barth. In his Philippians commentary, there's good reason for what the ancient painters did when, in their representations of Christ ascending to heaven and throned in heaven, they left the wounds from the cross. That is the meaning of the Dio, therefore. It does not say that he who was humbled and humiliated was afterwards exalted 
was indeed rewarded for his self-denial and obedience. But what it says is that precisely he who was abased and humbled, even to the obedience of death on the cross, is also the exalted one. The God of the universe who found himself on the cross, abased and humiliated, is in that moment also the exalted one. He is the Lord for whom all nations and peoples will worship. It's not as if he gave that up and somehow Jesus as a reward says, okay, you did a good job, now I'm going to give this to you. He didn't become Lord. It was God taking on flesh from day one as Lord of the universe dwelling in the midst of his people and God of the universe in that flesh, on that cross, conquering evil. And Jesus then is now known as the Lord of the universe as a result of it. Because of that resurrection, the world can now see that yes, this in fact is who he was on that cross. Glory is displayed on the cross. God's equal has found his right in this and that in his abasement and humiliation, he is Lord over all. I know we read this before. It's just so important. In his humiliation and abasement, he is Lord over all. In that, in doing that, he is Lord. God has found his glory in this, that he prepares his kingdom in incomprehensible condescension. So um, it's Giovanni's ascension there, and you can see the wounds on the hands, the wound in the side of Jesus rising to heaven, which plays also into the imagery that John has of the lamb standing slain at the throne, right? Jesus ascends to heaven, is at the right hand of God, standing there as a a slain lamb not as a conquering lion, as a slain lamb. This is the heart of our religion. This is the heart of our belief. That God of the universe humbles himself to the point of death and thereby redeems all of creation. If that's not a paradox, I don't know what is. Okay, let's go to the next slide. A few different places where we see Paul talking about our role. So that was Jesus. Now we'll transition to thinking about what this means for you and I. Okay? Ephesians 2. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of great love for which he was loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Do you see how many ends there are just in this one little section? And you see how if you don't understand that word incorrectly, everything changes. Or if you don't make something of it theologically significant, somehow it's flattened. Where are we? We are in Christ. Where is Christ? At the right hand of God. If we are in Christ and he is at the right hand of God, then we are seated at the right hand of God. This is our truest identity. No matter what you think of your life looking like or being like, this is the most real thing about you. You are in Christ, identified by the person of Christ, loved by God as a child of God, included in the family of God, declared justified, declared redeemed, declared a new human, and seated at the right hand of God. That's the truest thing about you as a human. Everything else falls away. What do you do at the right hand of God? 
If this is your truest identity and truest location, what are you meant to be doing as somebody seated at the right hand of God? Romans 8.34, who then is the one who condemns? No one. Jesus Christ who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and also interceding for us. What does Jesus do, having ascended to the throne, being at the right hand of God, as this slain lamb? What is this slain lamb doing? He is interceding for us. He is serving as a priest. He's offering prayers on behalf of us. He is working on behalf of us and his created order. What are we meant to be doing at the right hand of God? Likely the same thing, interceding on behalf of God's good creation. So I'm framing us now around our key verses of Romans 8, 28 through 30. 8, 34, Jesus is at the right hand of God interceding for us. I'm going to bring us backwards and create the sandwich for Romans 8, 26 through 27. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. Um, If you were to open a commentary, do you know what you'd find for this? Mostly just one thing. This is a random group of verses that are hard to make sense of because there's nothing about prayer anywhere around this. In Romans 8, Paul goes from creation groaning, waiting for its own redemption, waiting for the children of God to be glorified, to reveal their glory, to be the people through whom the, the, the created order itself will be liberated. But it's groaning, waiting for its redemption. And then we get these two random verses on how the Spirit of God intercedes for us in prayer. And then we go to... Romans 8 through 30. And commentators don't know how to make what, what sense to make of this because it just doesn't fit the context. Why is he suddenly talking about prayer? Why is he suddenly talking about the Spirit interceding for us? I think, like these other verses, we've read it somewhat incorrectly. We read it typically as my suffering is so great, right, in connection with Romans 28, like I'm suffering, but good will come out of it. In the midst of that, I don't know how to pray, and so the Spirit prays for us, intercedes for us when we don't have words for our own suffering. Fine, that, that's, work. that's great. But I think it actually makes more sense in the context of Romans 8 where he's talking about what he's doing in and through his people for the goodness of creation around that rather than it being understood as the Spirit helps us in our weakness and the Spirit intercedes for us through wordless groans, but rather we are the ones at the right hand of God who are called to intercede on behalf of the created order to God, and we don't know what to say. I don't know if you found it, but I often don't have the words to pray in a situation of suffering. When one more bad thing happens in the world, somehow my words just don't feel adequate. I'd like to think that in those moments when we are at the right hand of God interceding on behalf of the world to God, that then the Holy Spirit intercedes through us, gives us the words that we can't find. So it's not for our benefit It's for assisting us as we are brought alongside God and God's work of redemption for interceding for the world. If we read it that way, it makes perfect sense. 
within this context of God calling people to be part of his family, to bring redemption to creation, to bring redemption to um, the, the good created world around us, bringing good to the world. Jesus at the right hand of God interceding on behalf of the world, that that's what we are called to do as people conform to the image of the Son. If we read it that way, it makes perfect sense and fits the context. If we read it as this kind of random couple verses on prayer and we think, well, why now? Why there? We've got the grand climax of Romans happening and we've got a couple little add-ons on prayer here. That makes no sense. But in this way, it makes absolute sense. What are we called to do? We're called to work with God to bring good to the world. That's our purpose for our redemption, the reason why we are glorified. How do we do that? We do that by acting as priests, kings, a kingdom of priests. What do priests do? They intercede. Jesus at the right hand of God interceding on behalf of all of us. The Holy Spirit helps us as we intercede on behalf of the good created world. Non-physical, sorry, non-human creation earlier in Romans 8 and also our fellow humans and everything that we exist and experience in life. We can go to the next one. Matthew, for kingdom of priests, the 12 Jesus sent out, these 12 Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Okay? As you go, proclaim the gospel. This is the gospel. In the beginning of Matthew, Jesus went and he proclaimed the good news. Repent and believe the kingdom of heaven has come near. That is what Matthew says the gospel is. The gospel equals the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now Jesus is telling his disciples, go out into these places and proclaim that the gospel, or the, the proclaim that the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of heaven in Matthew's case. He's writing to Jews. That the kingdom of heaven has come near. How do you proclaim that the kingdom of heaven has come near? You're a wretched sinner and God died for your sins or will die for your sins, maybe in two years from now. Just believe me, it'll happen. And then one day you can go to heaven when you die. No, of course not. That's ludicrous. How does he tell them to go and proclaim that the kingdom of God is near? Heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse those who have leprosy, drive out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. Because God calls people to worship him and to be used by him for bringing redemption to the world. And people don't care about shining like bright lights someday far off in the future, seven leagues past Pluto. They care about having health and life and love and, f- and, and thriving and f- and. and flourishing and peace and justice and righteousness. They care about those things now because life is meant to be lived and the only reason we struggle with living is because of Genesis 3 and our participation in Genesis 3, right? And our participation in Genesis 3 is what we have said no to And we've said yes to participating in the kingdom of God where no longer is it evil that is running the show but God himself. And we signed up now to give our allegiance to God and the kingdom of God to see life restored in the kingdom of God because that's what God is working toward. The original goodness that was in the beginning is coming back. But he doesn't do it on his own He chooses to use you and I. Proclaim the kingdom of heaven. God wants people to thrive. People need to flourish because God wants them to flourish. And the only way to make that happen is to undo the brokenness around us. What were we called to do originally? We were called to represent God to the world. 
What do we get to do now that we have been restored and redeemed in Christ, the new and perfect human? We get to participate in this work of redemption, doing what we were meant to do in the beginning. But this is right after you'll notice. Matthew says many more things. And then he says, you will be hated by everyone because of me. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Why is there a sense in which healing the sick, you know, meeting the needs of people will lead to a cross? Why would doing those things lead to the world hating you? Because it disrupts the status quo. Because the people in power no longer have control. Because the people who were formerly excluded are now included. And the people who had the world's glory and the world's honor and the world's wealth, they now no longer have that same reputation. Power gets disrupted. I don't know about you, but I don't think the world hates Christians. Not in the way that it seemed like we were meant to expect the world to hate Christians. And I don't know if that's just because our culture is now so adapted to the idea of Christianity, the idea of love, the idea of of justice or peace, right? We are a culture built on Christian virtues or if it's because Christians haven't always done the best job at truly proclaiming the kingdom of God. Conformity to Christ means participation in the entire life of Christ, including his life on earth, which was a cruciform life. If we are glorified in Christ and we are called to represent God to the world around us, it's a life that should be lived in anticipation of a cross, a cruciform life, a life of sacrifice, a life of potential suffering, a life of potential isolation, or being ostracized from a family, or a community, or an employer, or whatever it might be. The greatest paradox of Christianity is the fact that God revealed his glory, his truest sense, his power and authority and love on that cross. And that's what Jesus commissioned his disciples to do, the same thing. Proclaim these truths anticipating that the world will hate you for it and you may end up with a cross, on a cross. I don't know that we think those ways anymore. One more, I think. Yes. Back to Romans, and then we'll be done. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, we mentioned this phrase or this this key verse earlier. But he continues, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. We glory in our sufferings. And then Romans 8, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Do you see how he brings together these two themes right there of suffering and conquering? In the midst of these trials, in the midst of this suffering, we are more than conquerors. It's that conquering lion, slain lamb imagery again. God 
triumphing over evil by the cross. Conquering, triumphing through death, through suffering. How this happens, I don't know. That's the question we'll ask God when we get there, or here, or wherever this ends up being. But what is fairly clear throughout the biblical text is God asks of his people to live a cruciform life, a life shaped by the cross. And when they do so, they will be the most fully human they've really ever been, living into the purpose that they were actually created with, as well as living out the purpose of their redemption, the reason for why God redeemed them in the beginning. What are our lives for? It's not just to get to some shining place in heaven, in the future, after we die. Our lives are for living the cruciform life of cross, the cruciform life of Christ, whereby we work with God to bring goodness into the world. And when I say we work with God, God chooses us to work with him, right? To bring his goodness into the world. That's what Jesus was doing in Matthew. Go out, I give you the power to represent me to this world. And how they represented him was entering into the brokenness, entering into the suffering, entering into a life where they themselves would have glory, but a glory unrecognizable by the world. But you know who it is recognizable by? The people who are suffering. A hero is only a hero to the people whose needs are being met. And in this case, the people whose needs are being met are the people who can't enjoy a Sabbath. The people who suffer day after day under the broken systems of our world. They are the people who need goodness restored in their life, and they are the people whom God has called each of us in this room to give our lives in cooperation with God to participate in that work of redemption. And if we don't do so, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 6, 1, we've received the grace of God in vain. We've taken it for ourselves and kept it for ourselves and not recognized why it was there all along. We're not the end goal. The redemption of all things, reconciliation of all things is God's end goal. And he chooses to use us in that process. And that's what it looks like to be fully human and to be glorified, ruling over the fish in the sea, the birds in the air, sharing this created world with one another, representing God to the world around us, interceding on behalf of the world to God. Um, okay, I think that's all I have. Uh, I think there's maybe one recap. So that's where we went. Created, redeemed, crucified, and there's the verses for you again. Okay, so let's do, I think, questions. Yeah. Wow, that's a lot to think about. It's a lot to take in. <laughs> My head is spinning. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. Um, so I would like to ask Chris Kwan to come forward, and she is a professor um, of theology at St. Paul School of Theology, her master's in divinity from Yale, a PhD from Emory, and her expertise is feminist theology, and Dr. Robert Martin is also going to come forward, PhD, Princeton Theological Seminary. He has taught at Yale Divinity School and St. Paul School of Theology, most recently served as Dean and Professor of Christian Formation and Leadership at Wesley Theological Seminary. He is also an author, consultant, and speaker. And the two of them are going to lead our Q&A. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for uh, um, such a mm, large story arc. Mm. Uh, uh, I think um, 
I often think of biblical theologians doing that kind of narrative approach to the text. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, you brought us into a conceptual look at the glory, that, and the notions of glory, and went from Genesis to Revelation um, in some really intriguing ways. I really want to thank you for that. Um, my question uh, relates to my interest in feminism, especially around issues of gender and biblical interpretation. Mm -hmm. And so I was, when you, when you worked with the image passages and, the, and Paul, um, there was one that I didn't hear, and I would like to hear you think of, um, out loud with us about mm. it. When um, in, in Corinthians, when the discussion is about uh, God, Christ being God's image and the husband being the image of Christ and the wife being something, mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 right? <laughs> so, I mean, yeah. so this yeah. kind of a, um, household hierarchy, the yeah. hierarchical relationship, and even in some ways a, a subordination of the second person sure. of the Trinity, but then certainly a human subordination um, and who reflects the image. How much time do we have for this? Um, <laughs> uh, well, because you, you left it out, I think you must have thought of it, um, and so I, I just want to hear some response to how, how have you thought about that yeah. and, and when, as you're working with Paul yeah. and d your decision not to include it um, is, is an important decision. Yep, yep. Oh, I have this one actually. Oh, you've got yep. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so I mean, I didn't include it here because of time constraints and I actually I didn't include it in the larger projects because of space constraints. Um, there's, there's so much more that I could have added throughout Paul's letters, for me, even in my own project, I had to stick just with Romans, um, because that alone is, it's Romans. Um, so with it, though, I, I honestly can say I don't know, and I'm happy to say I don't know. I don't know that anybody does. It feels like, um, so it's, it's, it's not, I don't think it's so much image language as much as glory, oddly, there. Um, the, the husband is the um, glory of Christ and the wife is the glory of the husband. Um, I, I think Paul is working within his cultural constraints there, but I don't think he means um, a sense of rule in this context. I think he's referring to a sense of honor within that, that context of the first century patriarchal culture. So I don't think that he is suggesting that the wives are therefore, because they're the glory of the husband, that they are therefore meant to be submissive or subservient to. I don't think that there's any sort of second person submission happening within the, the, the Godhead, um, but, but rather a sense of, um, uh, of honor without the sense of rule, of just not reputation even either, um, in the way that I would say, like, my husband is proud of me. He sent me a text saying, I hope it goes well today. I'm so proud of you. I love you, right? I am his honor, his glory. When he says, oh yeah, Haley's doing this, he's so proud that I am in that way his glory. It doesn't work necessarily to think of that in the way of the husband has that for Jesus and for, um, or Jesus has the husband and the husband then has a wife. But that's where I think, I don't know. And I don't know that anybody does because the way that Paul uses glory there doesn't fit both what I see his theology being elsewhere in terms of equality, um, but then also how he just uses glory in general, which also leads to the trickiness. He does use glory in these different ways. Um, there are, like we have in, in Second Corinthians, he does use glory as shining, right? The, the face of Christ is bright, it's shining. Um, the, the old covenant, he says in 2 Corinthians 3, right, was more glorious than, the, or the, the new covenant is more glorious than the old covenant. So Paul uses glory in lots of different ways. 2 Corinthians, no, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, he's talking about the, the physical body that would be raised to life. Um, he uses the imagery of, of the uh, sun, moon, and stars again, and says one has one form of glory, another one has another form of glory. Um, uh, a seed 
has a form of glory, and when it comes up out of the ground, it has a new form of glory. There's consistency between these two objects, but there's something different. So in other words, he uses the word glory in different ways, which is why for me, I had to limit my project just to what he's doing in Romans to try to make sense. So I don't have a good answer because I wish that Paul never wrote that. <laughs> but he did, I think, and um, I, I need to have it square with what he says elsewhere and the traditional notions of submission or hierarchy within a family don't fit what I see him saying elsewhere and how he views women elsewhere and what their roles are in ministry and society. So I don't know. Yeah. Okay. I'm Thanks. happy to say that, I yeah, don't know. An intriguing answer. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> so first of all, thank you so much. This is... Um, been very challenging, right? You're the point that we are we are not just to enjoy uh, the peace and love of of God only, but we are to extend that mm -hmm. in a reign, a, a rule establishing a way of life in which everything can flourish mm -hmm. uh, more fully. So that kind of challenge, I um, one could hear your lecture and hear a lot of challenge to individuals. Mm. How are we going to do this in our daily life, in our work, families, those sorts of mm -hmm. things? I'm wondering if we can broaden that to the communities and institutions uh, that we live in. So um, if as individuals we're to be challenged to understand ourselves and really feel ourselves at sitting in Christ at the right hand of God mm -hmm. and reigning, ruling, and having dominion over or uh, with things, how does that apply to churches, to congregations, to us, to our families as a whole, mm -hmm. right? How, how, do you, how do you think of these kinds of communities, community, you know, where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I, in the midst. And so it seems like we have an opportunity for this not just to challenge individuals, but to challenge our institutions, our congregations, this congregation, uh, and, and everyone online. How can we reestablish a kind of reign among us that is more Christ-like, in which we collectively become more Christ-like and then help, yeah. you know, foster yeah. flourishing. Right, so. right. I think for your church, keep doing what you're doing. Based on what I have kind of seen, the flyers in the bathroom stalls and on the walls and on your, you know, website, it feels to me like your church anyway already has a sense of what we're called to do, which is to say meet the needs of those in our communities. But it's that question of asking even as, as a family, asking as a business, asking as an office space, as a church, what are we called to do? What is our overarching purpose that we or that our, right? We all come as individuals and it only works for the most part if everyone understands their first role as an individual, that comes together, why are we going to exist? What's the purpose for it? And if we can acknowledge that our purpose is to bring good into the world, then you say, okay, well then where, where are our resources? What type of resources do we have? What type of neighborhood are we in? What are the needs of the neighborhood for a church or for a business? Um, it's one of those things where I don't think it's rocket science. I think we, we naturally do it. I think churches, if we can, if we can, we're just familiar with churches, sadly, so often churches now are focused on numbers, right? How many people are members? Um, I actually wonder if the church would be a whole lot more healthy if we had fewer people listed in membership roles. Because what it would mean is the people who actually get it are there, and those who say, no, thank you, that's not the Christianity or the Christian experience I want, um, will realize that this church is actually for something, for something significant that might be costly. 
and the people who are willing to take up that cross, right, who are willing to participate and actually give their life for this cause, they're there. Oftentimes, today in American churches, we want people there because that brings in tithes, but also because that means we have a better reputation. We're more well-known, and here's false glory. Pastors' names get known. They've got the big church on the corner of, you know, whatever and whatever, or they, they you know, are the TV whatever, whatever, or um, whatever it might be, numbers mean size, size means reputation, and if you can keep mostly things in line, you're likely to have an okay reputation. What will you actually be known for? Sadly, increasingly, it's scandal. Um, and then you're either known for that or you're known for being the place where people know they're loved and welcomed and accepted and needs are met. Or you're just neutral and nobody knows you and the reason for that is the main thing that people come for is some pietistic, individualistic experience where they think by going to church, they somehow now tick the box and they did their Christian thing for the day or they you know, did what they were called to do and that's that. That's all that God asks of them. And so we might have you know, some feel-good sermons where you know, we just say, yep, you just keep doing this or you read your Bible or you you worship God, like, I don't want to make it sound, I'm not cynical, um, but I do think we have a individualistic and pietistic approach to Christianity in our country, especially within evangelicalism, and those churches, maybe they make a difference in the community, and maybe everything you know, begins and ends with what happens on that Sunday morning in the individual's heart. In which case, I would say, they need to ask the question, why are we here and why do we exist as a church? Is it just for me as an individual to grow in my faith or have a worship experience and then go home? Or is it for us to live life together, to be in community with one another, to strengthen one another, and to engage in the hard things of life with one another, for one another, on behalf of the world around us. Like, w asking the question, what's our purpose for existing? Why do Sunday mornings happen? What's the purpose of coming to church and hearing a sermon? Is it just for me at the end of the day? Is it for us to be together as a community? Is it for us to be together as a community to hear an idea that we can then talk about and increase in our faith? It's getting better. Is it to be together to learn more about who God is and what he acts, asks of us as a faith community? To be able to then be together and think creatively together about how we might be used in the world around us, right? So it's just that progression of what are we here for and how do we get there? So just a just a um, maybe get a, a bit more concrete about this. F for our congregations to have a cruciform life together and for our ministry to be cruciform, have you seen examples of that? Can you, can you help us think more concretely about, about that? Um, I've seen many examples, and most of them are overseas. Fine. Great. In, uh, in non-Christian, non-Western contexts where the church risks every single day that they proclaim Jesus. For um, some people, you know, just the idea of proclaiming Christ is potentially going to land them in prison. Um, if, you, if you challenge your government, right, you think of China. You challenge your government and question what they're doing and question their policies. Where does it end you? It ends you in prison. You're silenced. What's our role as Christians? As a church, is it, I mean, should we not do that knowing that that's the risk? Do we stay silent? And 
Or do we take the risks where we might be able to help somebody or bring change in some way, shape, or form? Um, I'm sure there are churches who live this life here in the States. They absolutely do exist. It looks different than in these other contexts where it's easier to see. Um, I mean, I, I'll speak for my church. I adore my church. Um, we're part of the ECC, Evangelical Covenant Church, um, which has many similarities, actually, to, to PCUSA and kind of the things that we value, inclusion, and saying Jesus is Lord, first and foremost, and after that, right, everything else is kind of peripheral. You think that, I think this, let's live life together as people worshiping God. Let's change the world together. You have your view, I'll have my view, but we're uniting on the fact that Jesus is Lord, and he's asked us to make change. He's asked us to give in these ways. Um, uh, you know, th think of the context. There are refugees who here are here in Kansas City. What are their needs, right? Welcome the foreigner in your midst. Is there a way that a church can actually meet the needs of the refugees such that when, whether it's Thrive International or, or whatever refugee organization is working with them, they can say, aha, I know of the people that are here to serve you. I can connect you with these people because they care about you even though they don't even know you. Where the church becomes known for doing these types of things. And it's not gonna look the same for every church, it can't. Um, but the point would be to just begin asking those questions and seeing how, as a church, we can actually be the people who are known as the people who do this. Um, to move it back to an individual point of view, one of the questions that's been posed is about Martin Luther King Jr. And wouldn't he be a prime example of being Christ-like? Um, um, the person that listed a few uh, disrupting power, uh, trying to do good, promote good. Um, In those ways, absolutely. Um, I think anybody who's willing to use their voice and say some form of corruption is not acceptable or some form of racism is not acceptable, or some, some form of, uh, of misogyny is not acceptable, or whatever it's going to be, anybody who's willing to use their voice and speak up for the lowly, or for the outsider, or the whomever it might be, they're going to be living a cruciform life 100%. That's what Jesus was doing. When he invited Z Zacchaeus, or or Levi, right, the tax collector, and he's eating with these, quote, sinners, that's entirely what he was doing, is upsetting the kind of status quo of who has power, who's considered in, who's considered out. And he's demonstrating that within the kingdom of God, all these things are overturned. So for a person like a Martin Luther King Jr. to use his voice and proclaim certain things are unacceptable, absolutely. Yeah. You want to say anything about your hesitation? Only that we only know the things that are reported about Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he had an entire life that I know very little about mm -hmm. that aren't the main clips that we see or the main you know, speeches that we hear. Um, it's like every person where we do good and yet at times we might not do good, or we might do things that necessarily aren't accepted by everybody. Mm, mm, so I don't want to just say, absolutely, uh, uh, Martin Luther uh, King Jr., he uh, is uh. the best example, or he's an amazing example of what it looks like. Mm, mm. I want to say, in the ways that I see him using his voice for mm. speaking against injustice, absolutely. Uh, uh, but I don't uh, want to lift up his entire life and person and being as a Christ-like example. So that's the hesitation. Yeah, you know this Lutheran is sinking Simul Eustace at Picotter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I love saying that in a Presbyterian church. Say that in English. Yeah, what's mean in English? For Simultaneously him? justified and sinful. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, here's another question, uh, Dr. Jacob. Could Jesus, uh, this I think concerns uh, um, the resurrected Jesus. Mm -hmm. Uh, and your discussion of the um, 
the resurrected body. Could Jesus just be needing the meat of human beings so that the, the Christ's followers could know he had been risen from the dead? So I th think, I don't know who I would go that, straight but to 1 Corinthians 15 to answer that. Okay. If Jesus Christ did not raise from the dead, our faith is in vain. It was not for humans and somehow meeting their need that Jesus rose from the dead with a physical body. It was because that's how God chose to demonstrate to the world that evil truly was conquered. Death mm. was defeated. Mm -hmm. It might still have a presence, but it was defeated. Um, there are not many places when Paul is extremely bold and clear-cut but that's one place, mm -hmm. which is so welcoming and grateful. I'm grateful for that because it's the heart of our faith, mm. right? What he was doing in that death and resurrection, and if we limit the resurrection to being somehow making us feel good, um, what is Christianity? Mm -hmm. um, then some religion where the God caters to the feelings of people so that they might feel good about themselves or no, no no we're dealing with something far 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 bigger and more significant than just the sense of me and how mm. i feel and how god interacts with me he mm. did something through that death and resurrection that changed the world mm. all aspects of reality were completely changed from that day onward and then we can figure out what it was that he was doing, then we understand how all aspects of reality were changed. Um, and I think that physical body was wildly important in the midst of that, because it's the physical world that God is redeeming. Mm -hmm. He's not just mm -hmm. redeeming our spiritual souls, right, yeah. so that we can go. He created the world as good in the beginning, and humanity was very good. It wasn't some sort of spiritual essence that he said was very good. It was the physical created world that he looked at and he said, it is good, it is very good. Mm -hmm. He came as a human. He entered into the physical brokenness of the world as a physical person. He died a physical death. He had to rise as a physical body because if he didn't, nothing would make sense. We'd have Platonic theology, and really that's mm. what the church has had for 2,000 years. We need to get away from Platonic mm -hmm. theology and recognize God cares about the physical world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, uh, here's a, a question that I'm going to um, put uh, to the pointed part. Um, it's around the matter of, the, of faith in Christ or faith of Christ uh, discussions, uh, New okay. Testament scholarship. Um, Will we be glorified through faith in Jesus or through the faith of Jesus? Um, okay, first off, I'm guessing most in the room are not familiar with that conversation. So it, there's a question within Pauline scholarship. When Paul says that we're saved through faith in Christ Jesus, you can also translate that by saying we're saved through the faithfulness of Jesus. At the end of the day, he still requires faith on the part of the person, but it does change who's doing the, the work. Mm -hmm. Is it me and my faith getting me there, or is it somehow Jesus's act of faithfulness has already brought me in, already dispensed that grace before I even place faith in it? So glory, can you ask the question again after that? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, well, it, uh, the, Will we Are be glorified through faith in Jesus or faith of Jesus? Um, in this case, I don't think it matters. It's they both are a result of salvation, mm -hmm. right? In terms of what comes first, we're justified in Christ. We're glorified in Christ. Um, it's true of him becomes true of us the faithfulness of kind of would be happening before mm -hmm. any of this. So the final answer, faith in Christ. <laughs> <laughs> final answer, do you need a lifeline? <laughs> I, don't, I don't think it matters. I think it's the fact that we are in Christ. Uh, uh -huh. uh. 
God has redeemed us in, in Christ. Christ. And because we are in Christ, if he is glorified, then we are glorified. If he's at the right hand of God, then we are at the right hand of God. If he is a child of God, then we are a child of okay. God. If he is justified, we are in him, we are justified. Yeah. So it's being in him more than the sense of where does faith happen mm. in the midst of these mm -hmm. things. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. The word power has so many cultural problems. Power from knowledge, power from coercion, power from persuasion. How do we move from these problems to understand glory manifested in power? Well, I think it's allowing words to allowing words to mean what they mean in the context that they mean. So I don't think power of knowledge has to be synonymous with or mean the same as power through suffering. Mm. Um, right, knowledge is power, right? Yes, we can learn something and therefore we have a greater understanding of what might be the case, and with that understanding, we can now make better and wiser decisions. But when we think of power as authority or a sense in which we can change something, we can have an impact on somebody, you're either going to have an impact on somebody for good or for ill. Mm. And if you use your power of whatever kind, decision-making, whatever it might be, if you do that, and it's for the, to the detriment of the person, then we're using our glory or our power inappropriately, not like Christ would. But if you use your power for the sake of meeting the needs, which sometimes requires you entering into that suffering, then you're using your power for something that's for the good, that would be cruciform. So I, I think just context, mm -hmm. it, I, don't, I don't know that we need to make them somehow be, mean the same thing everywhere. Um, words, words are remarkable mm. tools for understanding the world. It's the only tool we really have for understanding the world. It's mm -hmm. the only tool we have for communicating, um, right, a language, but the world is complex, so language mm -hmm. is complex, mm -hmm. so words are complex. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in English, we have you know, one word that gets used in many different contexts. Mm -hmm. In uh, some Asian languages, you've got mm -hmm. 10 words for 10 different contexts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, in Greek, there's like five or six words for love, and we have one word for love, and we have to figure out which context mm -hmm. we're in to be able to use it. So I, I just put power can, in that same category. Can I ask category. a personal question then uh, on, on kind of the power words? Uh, many uh, people in this congregation are not uh, as uh, used to the f frequent use of male language for God as you've g brought forward in your lecture. And I assume that's intentional given the debates around God language. I wonder if you would um, describe to us some of the, maybe one or two of the reasons why you, ch you choose to continue to use male pronouns for God? Only because I work with the text. So I 100% recognize that um, God isn't male. He doesn't have a body. He's not male. Um, that, that he... Um, I, 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 I'm not going to say God instead of he. I'm not trained to do that. And I want to say that simply by saying he doesn't mean that he's male and that he fits a description of being male, but rather this is simply how the text has chosen to speak about God or him. But what that means is he also is mother, right? So he is mother. I think I can say that. He is woman. He is feminine. He is maternal. He is all these things. Because he doesn't mean he is male, he is masculine, he is this. Not in the case of God. Um, so I, I use the words that the text does because I just look at the text. Mm. I'm not doing theology out here, mm. right? I have the text to be able to say, this is what a biblical theologian does. We have the text, mm -hmm. and you have to say, this is what the text says. How do we understand that appropriately mm. and not just according to what some people in culture might want it to be. Men 
historically have emphasized the maleness of God because it gives them more power. That's what it comes down to. But just because God is described with male pronouns doesn't make him male and it doesn't make him masculine and it doesn't mean that men have therefore more power. So I think it's a matter of being fair to the text, being fair to how God has chosen to reveal himself, but also doing justice to what he means by that. So, Thank you. Yep. Thank you.